Uh, thank you very much. I would like to introduce another former Washington Post reporter, my wife, Elsa Walsh. Will you please stand up? This is a great and wise lady. And uh, when we talked about what I should talk about tonight, she essentially said, uh, well, you know, why don't you discuss all the stupid things you've done? <laughs> and we decided that that would take all night. So I just want to pick uh, one. This was the late 1970s. And I was working on a story about uh, a Saudi arms dealer named Adnan Khashoggi. Some of you remember him. And uh, I wanted to interview him and sent uh, letters, intermediaries, phone messages, absolutely radio silence, nothing. And uh, one day in my office at the Post, the phone rang and said, um, gentleman with a nice Middle Eastern accent said, uh, Mr. Woodward? He said, yes, uh, I am Adnan Khashoggi's executive assistant. And uh, I would like to come have lunch with you. And we will talk about you talking to Mr. Khashoggi. And I'm going to be in uh, Washington uh, in two and a half weeks. And so I go ahead to my calendar. and." Uh, we'll have lunch. And I said, and you are? And he said, my name is Averill Fulsdy. Oh. Yeah. You should have been there to help me. <laughs> and of course, it turned out that the lunch was on April 1st. <laughs> so I put on my best suit and went to the outrage room at the Madison and uh, waited at the table. <laughs> Mr. Fulsday stood me up. <laughs> Don't laugh so hard, Graham. What's the bill? Please. So I ate alone. Uh, uh, Elsa and I have a daughter, and this was about seven or eight years ago, uh, when, or, no, I think she was about six or seven, she said, hey, uh, I understand you had a source named Deep Throat. I said, yes, and uh, that is a movie. I said, yes. <laughs> and it's about oral sex. I said, yes. And she said, what's oral sex? <laughs> and I knew I could answer her honestly. Because I said, I don't remember. <laughs> and I passed the buck by saying, ask your mother. <laughs> it was about uh, seven years ago, uh, Elsa and I were in Colorado at one of these conferences. and. Uh, wound up uh, at a dinner where I was seated next to Al Gore, the former vice president. Now, sitting next to Al Gore uh, at dinner, let's be honest, it's unpleasant. <laughs> and if you know anything about Gore's biography before he went into politics, he was a journalist and practiced journalism. And it turns out he thinks he invented that also. <laughs> so we're sitting there, and uh, I had written two of the four Bush books. And he started grinding on me about uh, the books, said, you know, why don't you come out against Bush in the Iraq war? And I said, look, I'm uh, just trying to find out what happened. He said, oh. Horseshit. Uh, actually, it was more than that. <laughs> and he said, I remember the Watergate stories. You and Carl Bernstein wrote those. You came out against Nixon and the crimes of Watergate. And uh, 
I said, no, actually those were, we tried to stick to the facts. And he said, look, Buster, I read those stories. <laughs> I said, I wrote those stories. <laughs> Not necessarily a man of self-doubt. <laughs> Didn't move the needle for Gore at all. He had read them. And uh, anyway, we, we got to a much more interesting subject, which was uh, at the core of journalism. How much do we know about what really goes on? And uh, something we report, you know, you, it's true. You get up in the morning and you wonder what you don't know and what's being hidden. And so I, I just asked, said, you were there for eight years in the Clinton presidency in the West Wing, and now it's five years after. There have been endless coverage, the Whitewater scandal, uh, the Lewinsky scandal, all kinds of books. I'd written some of them. Marinus had, you know, all kinds of people had written about it. So what percentage of what is significant or interesting do we now know? And he said, 1%. Well, of course, I died, and uh, I have to confess to having an unclean thought. <laughs> because when he said 1%, I immediately thought, is it possible there are that many women we don't know about? <laughs> Could be a big number. <laughs> and then I just asked, well, Suppose you wrote a tell-all memoir, and in his, he got on his high horse. I'd never write a tell-all memoir. Suppose you did. Then how much would we know about what went on that's interesting or of consequence? And he said, 2%. <laughs> now, that's just gore being gore, but the, but the interesting thing, uh, what you have to do is develop a method, have... Uh, the luxury in the patients, which I thank the Washington Post for, to uh, really try to dig into things. And uh, you need to be at the right place at the right time. And uh, Jerome, are we ready? Okay. Here, oh, good. You did a, I've got, this is the first time I've used slides. Now this is a uh, picture well known, uh, Nixon leaving the White House uh, in August 1974. And you've probably seen it in a magazine or newspapers and so forth. Pardon? It's in, our hallway. it's in your hallway. Okay, now I want to just show you the same picture from a different angle. Oh, didn't work. It makes a difference to be on the helicopter <laughs> and you're, when you're working on that story. Then I, uh, this, actually these pictures are from, really from uh, Elsa's home photo album. Uh, there's this one, the Supreme Court. <laughs> there's this one, I did a book on John Belushi. Uh, you know, this was a clumsy attempt by me to be hip. <laughs> Clearly didn't work. Uh, you have to look a little closely here at a, cl a Clinton cabinet meeting. I'm sitting in the back. Uh, uh, they used to have lunch together <laughs> alone. <laughs> then we go to Bush. Wanted to get to know him. Now, the, the real challenge was the Obama administration. M message control, very difficult to get through, and so forth. And so here's the president <laughs> looking. He'd heard something, and uh, this is what it <laughs> <laughs> he. Uh, and the only way when you're caught like that is to, is to smile and apologize. 
And then here's Biden on the phone. <laughs> Here is sometimes you have to do things that you normally don't do, like walk the dog. <laughs> now this is a picture you've seen many, many times, right? Uh, the whole national security team and the president watching the Osama bin Laden raid. Now, what they did is they airbrushed this picture. <laughs> and that's not the real one. Here's the real one. <laughs> <laughs> now, sometimes you get, you know, the tense moments in the White House and uh, uh, people are distracted and the president will let you sit in his lap. It, as you see, uh, in this case, uh, that's what happened. Uh, now, uh, this is a well-known photo. It's uh, in my new book, the president and Speaker Boehner uh, meeting on the patio outside the Oval Office, uh, <coughs> excuse me, on a summer day. And uh, the, they have both, ta uh, when I interviewed them for this book, they talked about this meeting and uh, they were doing, uh, drinking and consuming different things. And so, uh, you see, <laughs> I got some Merlot and uh, camels for the speaker and for the president, uh, iced tea and Nicorettes. <laughs> and uh, then this was my reward. Okay, now, the, uh, I, I want to tell one other story quickly, and that is, uh, it was uh, when Hillary Clinton was senator from New York, and she, uh, I, she was giving a speech one night, and I was giving a speech to the same group, and afterwards, we stopped to talk. And uh, she said, uh, that she had quote, quoted all the time from my book, Plan of Attack, which is the second uh, Bush book about how we decided to go to war in Iraq. And uh, I said, oh, well, what do you quote? And she said, oh, the last line in the book. Bush asked, uh, how do you think history will view your Iraq war? And Bush stood in the Oval Office, threw his hands in the air, and said, history we won't know, we'll all be dead. <laughs> Comforting thought. Good way to end the book. I said, well, now why do you quote that all the time? And she said, you can't be president of the United States and talk like that. And I said, well, well now wait a minute, why? And she said, look, Bush is a fatalist, somebody who does his job, but really turns it over to other people and turns history over to other people. And I remember thinking, if she ever became president and somebody went and asked her, how do you think history would judge your decision on something, she would answer, I'll write it. <laughs> I said, so, you know, why, you know, Bush, and she really got, and she started getting kind of slapping her fist in her hand, kind of that lamp-throwing anger. <laughs> I stepped back a little bit, and, and uh, she said, George Bush is a fatalist. And I pushed back a little bit and said, you know, uh, Lincoln was a fatalist. She said, no, you cannot talk like that and be president of the United States. And uh, pushed back a little bit more, he said, look, George Washington would never talk like that. Thomas Jefferson would never talk like that. Bill would never talk <laughs> like that. And I, so I thought, oh, the new Mount Rushmore. <laughs> Washington, Jefferson, and Bill. And I was going to say something. And then I imagined ahead to the history we don't know and the future we don't know. <laughs> uh.
Washington, Jefferson, Clinton, and Clinton. <laughs> and I was going to say something to her uh, when she talked about Bill and so forth. And then I thought, which you know, this is what we, this is the dilemma we live in as reporters. And this is where George W. Bush had it right. Uh, we don't know. We'll all be dead. You saw it here first. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. I'm not now quite those, sure what to say. No, those, wait a minute. Come back. My lawyer said, make sure that those pictures do not get on the internet. And, and so, can will everyone agree that it's off the record? Right? What? I think it's too late. You think it's too late? Oh, uh, oh, okay, I was, I was okay. Because I remember Don's mother, Catherine's grandmother, uh, when I'd worked for the Post for, uh, I guess, about a year. It, you would go to. She would have these breakfast dinners receptions at her house. And the rule for a reporter was it's totally and absolutely off the record. And I believed that for about six months. <laughs> and then one morning, Catherine Graham herself called me up and said, you know, the Secretary of Defense was here for dinner last night, and he had the most interesting things to say. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, and let me go get my notes. <laughs> that I wrote down. And as you know, she was a great note taker. And so she read out what the Secretary of Defense had. And uh, clearly it was off the record, but that didn't mean that you couldn't ask others and check it out. So we got a bunch of good stories. And I used to joke with her that we had the Graham modification of off the record, <laughs> which was you absolutely and totally can't use it unless it's really good. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I would like to introduce another former Washington Post reporter, my wife, Elsa Walsh. Will you please stand up? This is a great and wise lady. And uh, when we talked about what I should talk about tonight, she essentially said, uh, well, you know, why don't you discuss all the stupid things you've done? <laughs> and we decided that that would take all night. So I just want to pick uh, one. This was the late 1970s, and I was working on a story about uh, a Saudi arms dealer named Adnan Khashoggi. Some of you remember him. And the Eastern accent said, uh, Mr. Woodward? said, yes, uh, I am Adnan Khashoggi's executive assistant, and uh, I would like to come have lunch with you, and we will talk about you talking to Mr. Khashoggi, and I'm going to be in, uh, uh, I wanted to interview him and sent uh, letters, intermediaries, phone messages, absolutely radio silence, nothing. And uh, one day in my office at the Post, the phone rang and said, um, gentleman with a nice middle